This is the uh, April 2021 version of the Mount Vernon Clinic, which is a function of the fourth division PNR and MRA. I'm ready to get started. Nick, are you ready to go? I'm ready to go. Okay, so just to say, you know, there were three of us on this adventure later on, and there are the names myself and my two friends, Ted and Dick. And so uh, the first time we went to the Westside Lumber Company was in 1961. I grew up in the San Fernando Valley. The Southern Pacific coastline ran right behind my door. And uh, so when I was 9, 10, this is what my HO scale layout looked like. The only extant photo, I think. And of course, I was running Athern rubber band drive F units, probably one of the worst things that ever happened to the hobby. It, was uh, in the magazines they had an ad for a Pacific Fast Mail catalog, which as a young kid, that was just amazing to see these brass models. And I, uh, in this issue here, was this picture of a Shea. And to that point in my life, I'd never seen a Shea. And the combination of the odd locomotive in the woods with the orange lettering just really appealed to me. Well, our next door neighbor was George Hook of Central Valley Models, and he told me he'd been up there. So I talked my dad into taking me to Tuolumne when our family were vacationing in Yosemite. And so here is the pass from 613 of 60, my dad and I, to see the mill, purpose, trains. And that's it. That's all you had to have to have access to the yard. There's my first photo. The engine house was Shea number eight. The mechanic was Ed Sullivan, and he kept those Shays in tip-top condition, both the way they ran and the way they looked. So this is the log dump. I guess every railroad has their way. They pull the cars up there, and a gauntlet track ran the cars close here to this ledge, which had a rail on it. They hooked a cable under the car onto this rail, and when they pulled the cable up, it pulled the logs off into the water. So here's number 10 heading out to pick up a train of empties. And of course, it's one of Murphy's law that the business side of the shea is always on the shady side. And of course, they were switching the mill with Heisler number three which was a narrow gauge Heisler, which had been standard gauge to switch the mill. Here's the mill building. That's my, that's a, this is the jack lift bringing the logs up from the pond and that's my dad on top. And this is a tail track. As they unloaded the log cars, they shoved the empties around here till they were ready to pull them back out. South face of the mill. And here's a, a departing view looking back at the mill yard. Now I had it arranged so these videos would play, but um, it's not working. Even though I had it working, it's not working now. So uh, with that short visit, we wanted to come back again. So here we are in August of 1961, going from Tuolumne to Camp 8 to River Bridge. The idea was we would hike out of Tuolumne towards Camp 8. That way we could see all of the trains as they passed us while we were hiking along the right of way. Sad to say that during the interval time, they quit running trains into the woods. The only thing left running was the number three uh, at Tuolumne. And here's the Tuolumne Depot with its unusual roof style uh, since burned down. So we were back in the mill again and watch number three switching the mill. And here's a nice photograph. Notice, even though this locomotive is closer than the boxcar, look how much larger the standard gauge boxcar is than what's really a narrow gauge Heisler. This is the junction of the uh, Westside Lumber Company with the Sierra Railroad.
and their covered loading dock. And so this is headed out towards the woods and uh, it's dual gauge trackage here all the way out to the water tower so that standard gauge engines could make it to the water tower. And this goes up to the Y where they turn the chaise. And here you can see the gauntlet track. The shay would run on the tracks away from the unloading dock and the log cars would run on the tracks close to the unloading dock so that they could tip them up and dump the logs. Of course, all the, all the, waste, all the waste or slash from the mill came up this conveyor belt and went into uh, their trash burner. You can't see it. Unfortunately, these are the doors of the slash burner and it had Westside Lumber Company cast into the doors. Here's the jack lift bringing logs up from the pond. And at the top of the jack lift was a pressure washer to get off loose bark and particularly rocks and things that might uh, dull the saws. And just inside the saw uh, mill building was this uh, head saw we used to cut logs to length. And here's a uh, flash picture of the saw carriage. It's a shotgun carriage powered by a steam piston and the band saw is double sided so it cuts both directions. And this is down in the engine room. We actually got to see the single cylinder Corliss steam engine that drove the whole plant in operation, but it was so buried down inside the mill there was no way you could get back far enough to get a picture of it. Of course, out in the yard were all of these store shays stored uh, out of service now. And of course, because they existed to this late date and all in relatively good shape, the great majority of them found good homes. Of course, Westside was famous for all their unique home built cabooses. And here were the camp warehouses. Uh, and if this used to be uh, Hetch Hetchy Valley Railroad Depot, serving now as the dispatcher's office for the west side. Here's one of their little home-built speeders. All this stuff just begs to be modeled. And this was the original. This was the original roundhouse, but in the later days, it was the car shops. And here we are headed out of town with dual gauge track headed for fuel and water. And this was the car repair shop where they did the work, particularly on all of the uh, skeleton log cars. And uh, tank cars would run up here on the, on the standard gauge track and then oil would be fed down through this pipe to uh, oil the fuel the shays. And of course, he used white gas for, uh, for stoves and other things in the woods. So here was white gas storage in their tank car number one up on the high track. And wedge snow plow. Now this is having come around here, we're looking back towards the mill. Here's the car shops. Here's the dual gauge track. and headed out towards the woods. Here is the water tower and hand, and hand car shed. And that's the last water stop before the woods. And that's a video that won't run. So from here on out, this is where the line out to the woods crossed the highway coming into town. And we, 
drove out to Camp 8 and spent the night there. This is morning sky at Camp 8. Then we hiked up the up the grade above Camp 8 where there's this rather distinctive rock cut. You see it in a lot of pictures, especially Stan Kistler's pictures and movies. And whistleboard above Camp 8. And this is the water tower above Camp 8. You can see it's still full. Of, when we went, when we were there, it's still full of water. I always thought the combination of the green foliage and the red dirt was uh, very attractive. Be fun to model. This is the abandoned spur to Camp Ten, and here is the every at each uh, switch. Uh, let's see, siding along the line, there was a telephone shack. So this is the telephone shack for Camp 8. And the cookhouse at Camp 8. And the upline switch at Camp 8. And this would be a typical ground throw for the west side. It's basically a rod with a, a weighted ball on one, a ball to weight it on one end. And there's the water tower at Camp 8. Um, Inside this shed was a caterpillar, D8 caterpillar. And this would have been typical uh, at each camp, a pile of wood blocks that was used for to fire the cooking stoves, to fire the boiler for hot water for showers. And here's a camp car at Camp 8. It's on trucks, so it could be moved from place to place. And further down, the how furthest we hiked down the line was to River Bridge, which is uh, stood for quite a while, but is no longer there. It was taken apart to salvage the lumber out of it. And Westing, West Side Lumber Company's insurance policy stated that the major trestles were insured against fire, provided they had a fire watchman at each bridge. So each of the four major trestles had a fire watchman's shanty where the watchman stayed and kept an eye on the trestle after the trains had passed. And that's the siding below River Bridge. And River Bridge from the other direction. And under River Bridge flows the North Fork of the Tuolumne River. Upstream is very rocky. And below River Bridge, a siding. So uh, we thought it wouldn't be nice if somehow we could ride these rails. So it is, we built our own speeder. It would be powered by poles uh, and strong arms. And the idea was we would ride it down the track below Camp 8, uh, which was the steepest grade downgrade on the railroad. So, but we made an unauthorized visit to the mill. Nobody was in the watch shanty. We just went in. This is the dam at the lower end of the mill pond, which uh, held back, turned back creek, which is uh, where they floated the logs. And it's a rainy day and fire danger is low. So it was a treat to be able to go anywhere we wanted, wander all over the mill yard, in and out of the chaise. So we got some uh, pictures inside the cab of the chaise. My first time inside. Okay. They were all oil fired. And the cab interiors painted that dark green color. All the cabooses lined up out of service. Cars of new ties were nowhere to go.
And of course, since this was not a class one railroad, um, a lot of older equipment still use Lincoln pin couplers. And there's one of their flat cars with a great load of junk on it. And here is one of the company refrigerator, ice refrigerator cars. Again, here's the car shops and uh, the old roundhouse. Here's the Hetch Hetchy Railroad Depot uh, dispatcher's office. And this is headed up towards the Y. So the tail of the Y goes back into there where the fuel uh, and sand are delivered. This is the connecting leg of the Y and a siding. So again, here's the Y turning here. And I thought this was interesting. You know, not many people know the West Side Lumber Company had one crossing, narrow gauge crossing up and the, where the Y was located. So here is the gate to the woods, and that'll be come out again later in the talk, and the hand car sheds. And of course, number two was in the park at that time. So here we're back at Camp 8. Here's the cookhouse. And you know, there was still uh, food and plates and calendars and stuff in there from uh, when the cookhouse had been recently in service. And these uh, skeleton log cars were bought from the Swain Lumber, purchased, I should say, from the Swain Lumber Company. And so here's the pile of, oops, yep. Here's the pile of wood slabs and this boiler here, it makes hot water for the shower car. No longer a pressure vessel, it just heats hot water. And the meadow below Camp 8. So here is our home built car. <clears throat> it's a four by four frame with an X across the middle, little box at the back. Brakes are these things with rubber tire pieces on the end of them. And here are the poles. We made the wheels by taking the heaviest garden wheels we could find and having bolting flanges to the back of them. And there is my friend Dick and I on the car. And we realized that the concept of track gauge on the West Side Lumber Company was very flexible. So we brought spacers with us to correct for that. But uh, the bottom line was if we put the spacers wide enough that it didn't fall through the tracks in the wide spots, it was too wide to go through the narrow spots. Also, the rubber tires, well, not, not stiff enough to roll freely. And so that car, we pushed it around the yard for the fun of it, but it would not roll freely by itself. Here's the cabin where we stayed while we were at Camp 8. Now the West Side Lumber Company uh, ran dual hoses at the, both down their cars. One was automatic air like you would normally think of, but one was straight air. So automatic air, you reduce the pressure to bring the brakes on. Straight air, you increase the pressure to bring the brakes on. Uh, Idea being, if one system failed, the other would work. There's the caterpillar shed. Used to be an oil tank on top of these. This supports the oil tank itself is gone. Here's the ground throw switch machine, water tank, and cut above camp. Here's the caterpillar in the shed. Looks like it's <laughs> well used. So this time we hiked down grade below Camp 8. Yeah, very lightweight rail. If you model this, it'd be code 40.
and all these little details like the wooden retaining wall. Wood they had plenty of, so wherever they could, they used it. And at various places along the line were speeder set outs um, and uh, our track car set outs, and these were numbered. So here's number three, they were numbered sequentially outbound from Tuolumne. And here is the tank at straight track. It's the longest stretch of straight track on the west side. So it's called straight track siding. And here's a, a water culvert made out of wood. Of course, it's a beautiful time of year. The trees are in their fall colors. And we walked all the way down to River Bridge. There is a place uh, called Loop above River Bridge where the track to gain height makes a horseshoe curve. So this is the cut at Loop. So of course, I had to model the West Side Lumber Company now. So the Santa Fe Railroad went out and here would be Camp 8 with the west side spiraling up over trestles up eventually to Camp 45. There's the Clavy, Ridge, uh, Clavy River Bridge with its angle bents in the middle of the trestle. So that was my west side lumber company. And here's the golden spike when I finally got the rail laid. It was uh, hand spiked. So the next trip we took was in July of 1962. So far, we've only been, we've not been past Camp 8. We wanted to get deeper into the woods. So we were planning to drive, to, I drive, see, I didn't have a license. My mom would drive us to Camp 21. We would hike to Camp 24, uh, to Camp Clavy and back. The problem was, <laughs> Number one, my mom wasn't thrilled about driving on dirt forest roads. Number two, with the Forest Service map we had and our level of experience, it was hard to know exactly where we were. Finally, it was a matter of, could we find the railroad at all? And this is where we found it. So actually, we were looking for Camp 21. Where we ended up was, took us a while to figure that out, Camp Deadwood. So here is the actual map of the west side that we were working from. So we wanted to be here at Camp 20. Here's, here's Tuolumne and Camp 8. We wanted to be over here at Camp 21, but we were actually here at Camp Deadwood. And there's Ted and I at the Y at Camp Deadwood. So now we're hiking, carrying packs from Camp Deadwood to Camp 24. This area has been logged off. Look at all of the skeleton log cars just left out in the woods. Here's the tank at Deadwood. Very common on the west side to put guardrails on curves like you see uh, here on this fill. Beautiful, I love Yosemite. This is like railroading in Yosemite. And notice you don't want to <laughs> you don't want to use snap track or flex track for this. Look at how uneven the ties are. Tie length was a not a particular standard on the west side either. So this used to be a forest road. It's been out of service long enough. There are trees growing in the middle of it. And this cross buck is currently in my attic. So here's a time for a rest. Packs get heavy. Those, this is old World War II pack frames. This is none of this lightweight Kelty stuff. So uh, finally, finally we reached the Camp 21 siding where there is a, a, a telephone shack which helped to identify the fact that this was Camp 21 and more abandoned log cars. And this is a waterfalls up on the 
hill behind Camp 23. So we realized that the railroad went all the way up the valley and then the railroad went all the way down the valley to get Camp 24. So if we hiked down this hill and cross the stream and hiked up that hill, we could get there a lot faster. And it, we really could. The downhill part went really well and the swimming in the stream went really well, but getting up the other side with packs didn't go so well. Now this area of Camp 24 suffered a fire in about 10 years previous called the Hull Creek Burn. So uh, that's why it looks like that. So then after a night at Camp 24, we started hiking to Camp Clavy because we wanted to see the Clavy River Bridge. And look how the ties are just in the dirt. There's no, there's no ballast on the west side. Here's one of their low budget bridges. This is a place called Boney Flats. And Two Mile Creek. Nice little falls at Two Mile Creek. Rock cut. And this is the water tank at the site of Camp 25. Little typo there. Here's another hand car set out. Of course, we took these pictures because planning to model the railroad. We left about 10 in the morning, I think, and it was mid-afternoon by the finally we got to the place where they loaded logs for Camp Clavy. It was actually a place below Clavy River Bridge called Buffalo Landing. And at Buffalo Landing, there was what had been a steam donkey, but the boiler had been removed and replaced by a diesel engine, so it's now a diesel donkey. And of course, uh, the empty log cars would be here and a cable from the donkey would run past these rollers to pull the cars up one at a time to load them. So those rollers went all around the curve. This is the telephone shack at Buffalo Landing. And uh, we decided that telephone should be preserved. I'm sitting here in my library. I'm looking at it right now on the wall. Here we are at mile 37 on the way to Clavy Bridge. And here's our first glimpse of it. All four major trestles on the west side were almost identical in size, 300 feet long and about 60 feet high. I guess the idea was they went that far back in the canyon and then it was more cost effective to build a trestle and make a U-turn. And this is the Clavy River Gorge. This is the watch, fireman's watch shanty for the Clavy River Bridge and a water tank. And there's a better view of the bridge. Great place to model. And in my West Side Lumber Company uh, book, train book of rules, um, you're not to accelerate or brake while trains are on the bridge. You just go on across at the same speed. Because accelerating or braking puts additional stress on the bridge. So that's the up, up, uh, up line side of the bridge. So a big story happens between that slide and this slide, and that is now it's about four o'clock in the afternoon. We had a late lunch and uh, we have to hike all the way back to Camp 24. Well, as I was sitting there eating, 
I looked down the hill and here was a railroad wheel sticking out of the brush. Not, not a log car wheel, but like a speeder wheel. So I went down and I pulled on it and lo and behold, it was attached to an axle on the other end was another wheel. So I thought, well, that's interesting. So I started looking around, make a long story short, I found two more wheels and an axle. Well, if we could turn this thing into a vehicle of some kind, we wouldn't have to carry all of our stuff all the way back to Camp 24. So looking around more, we found an angle iron frame that bolted to the wheels and we found wood that fit inside the angle iron frame. And we put the whole thing together, put our packs on it and used ropes to pull it all the way back to Camp 24 arriving about midnight. And here is Camp 24 the next day. Here's an overview of Camp 24. The cookhouse is here, a camp car, cabins, outhouse, There's a great view of the cookhouse. We slept in there on the floor. And also pertinent later in the talk, right here is a balloon turning track for the chaise. The way the west side operated, there were the woods engines and the town engines. The woods engines brought their loads down to Camp 24 and took empties back to the woods. The town engines came up with empties and went back with loads from Camp 24. So they had a place for turning the chaise. And again, this is the switch going to the balloon track. And here's another boiler, boiler for the shower car and another pile of wood blocks Great shot of Camp 24. So here we are with West Side Flyer number one. You can see the wheels, you can see the angle iron frame and the wood we put together to make this thing work. Also important is this piece of metal right here. It's a pipe. And um, I think it was used as a tow bar. Somehow it got bent at 90 degrees. Here's the water tank, it's switched back. And now we're back to uh, Camp Deadwood. And this is where we spent the night. And uh, cloudy sky, which threatened thunderstorm. So my mom was supposed to meet us back at this place, but a ranger came by and said that. My mom didn't want to drive on those roads again. So a ranger would be by to pick us up, but he never came and night came. So we had no more food and we had no shelter. There were no cabins, we had no tent. And about 10 o'clock at night, it started thundering and then it started raining and you could hear the thunder coming closer and closer. And uh, pretty soon it was a torrential downpour all, all of us, all of our sleeping bags were soaked to the skin. I didn't know about hypothermia in those days, but it would have been a good way to get it. And I prayed literally, God, if you hear the prayer of kids, please stop this storm. Well, in about 10 minutes, the rain had stopped and the clouds were out. And about uh, midnight, a ranger came by, rangers came by in a truck to fight small fires that had been started by the lightning, not a big fire, small, smoldering small fires, and to tell us that Jess Saunders couldn't come pick us up because he was busy fighting fires, so that if we were ever to get, if we were to get out of there, we'd have to figure out how to do it ourselves. And uh, foolishly, the day before, we figured we were done with the railroad car, so wouldn't it be fun to push it over the hill and see it fly apart? And so we did. So now we're in a position of having to haul it up back the hill and see if we can put it back together again. 
to coast down the hill from Camp Deadwood to Camp 8, which was for the most part a 4% grade. Well, we got the car back together again. We got all of our stuff on it. And here is where that tow bar on the rear end came in handy. If you laid it down, it would drag on the ties where the bent part was sticking up. So if you wanted to stop the car, you laid the tow bar down, stood on it, and held on to the upright part till the car stopped. So that's the way we got back to Tuolumne. So later that fall, we wanted to see more of the railroad, the other end of the line, Camp 45. So we went to Camp 45 and hiked back to the fourth and last of the four major trestles, the bridge at Borland. So here's sunrise at Camp 44 by friend Ted. In those days, you had to have a gun. We didn't know what we'd have to shoot, but boy, were we ready. That's the abandoned track at Camp 44. And a block and a spark arrestor from a steam donkey. And here is Camp 45. It was the last most distant operating camp of the west side. And you can see it's in the process of being torn up. And here is, it's actually not a woodblock car, that's a water car. And here's hiking downgrade to Borland Bridge. Here's the Borland River Bridge fire watchman shanty. So let's see, yeah, okay. So we're gonna get serious now. Uh, the uh, car with the rubber wheels didn't work. The car that we coasted down grade with worked, but it had no motor. So this time we're going to visit the Westside Lumber Company from end to end with a motorized car. So here is West Side number one, now reappearing as West Side number three. And this is the track right outside the mill yard in Tuolumne. We've got the body out of the camper. We've turned it upside down to bolt the axles, attach the wheels. And we had a one horsepower, five horsepower, excuse me, Briggs Stratton engine with a belt drive. And the wheels, the wheels on the previous car that we pulled were broken in various ways. One of them had a piece of flange knocked out of it to where it barely stayed on the track. As one edge of the broken flange came off, the other one just came on behind the rail. And one of the wheels had a big chunk broken out of the tread so that for this, my friend Dick turned a wooden pattern in shop. And my dad, who was a machinist, had them sand cast. Then we bored them on the lathe and fitted them on the car. So we made these wheels for this car. And the first obstacle was a mudslide over the old Dutchman Mine Road. The mud had washed across the tracks. We didn't know exactly what would happen and we were inexperienced, so we decided to pull a car across with chains. And the fascinating thing is, <laughs> that's 53 years later, here's what that site looks like. It's still covered with mud and the road is still there. So we took a lunch break at River Bridge. And this time we went across River Bridge riding not walking. Here's the abandoned branch line at Camp 10. We explored that on foot. To where it ended. Uh, ended. Spent the first night, my dad met us there in the camper at Camp Deadwood. We spent the night in the camper. And the next morning we headed out for Camp 24. But there's a big story that goes with that too. 
And, uh, let's see how to tell this story. Yes, partway up Hull Creek, the fuel line broke. It was a copper fuel line and it had work hardened and broke. Fortunately, my dad had agreed to meet us at Hull Creek. He went back into town and got more copper tubing, a cutter, a flaring tool, and also a rubber tubing so we could use to replace the fuel line. And then he left to go meet us at Camp Clavy. Well, the way the clutch on this car worked, again, we're just kids. <laughs> So the way I designed it is the motor sat on a steel plate that was hinged at the back. When you raised the motor, it engaged the belt and the car would move. If you lowered the motor, it disengaged the belt and the car would stop. So to perform this miracle, there was a threaded rod with a crank on the end. And on the underside of the plate that held the motor was a nut. And the nut was in a slot, so it couldn't turn. Well. In the process of replacing the fuel line, we had to take the motor off the car. We had to disassemble that clutch mechanism. And while I was standing at the back of the car, disassembling it, that bolt fell. It fell straight down. I saw it fell, fall. I saw the poof in the dust when it landed between the ties. And to make a long story short, to this day, we never found that bolt nut. And of course, the whole car <laughs> was non-functional without the nut. We looked and looked and looked as if our lives depended on it, which they did. So we had no other choice. We pushed the car all the way up Hull Creek to the end and all the way back up the other side to Camp 24. And to see if anywhere in Camp 24, we could find a nut of the correct size. That is when I learned the valuable distinction between national coarse and national fine thread. <clears throat> As you can guess, most everything in a lumber camp uses coarse thread. However, the car, the rod on the car used fine thread. So we looked and we looked and we looked. Finally, at Camp 24, there was a siding where they could spot oil cars up the hill where the oil cars would drain down into a tank. And then there was a pipe and a valve that we used to put oil in the chaise. I looked at that valve from the ground and thought, if there's anything in this entire camp refined enough from a mechanical standpoint to have a fine thread, it's gotta be that valve. So I got a straw of the valve and scooted my way out to the end of it, unscrewed to the, one of the nuts. And thank God it was the right size. So we used that nut for the car for the remainder of the trip. Had to have guns. So here's a two by two rack with the guns, 30-06-22 shotgun. And here is the only break, which is a piece of angle iron, which drags on the rail. And we found that basically that was unnecessary because just turning the engine off with the clutch engage would stop the car for the most part. So here we are crossing Borley River Bridge. And we came into Camp Reynolds and came around the curve. <laughs> And this is what we found. They had crossed this creek on a fill. Again, about 300 feet long, about 60 feet high. And sometime during the previous spring thaw, the wooden culvert at the bottom had become plugged and water had filled all the way up to the top. And then with a giant whoosh, the whole thing had given way and carried trees and everything else downstream and left the rails hanging in the air. Well, we didn't want to miss seeing the rest of the railroad, so we would have to deal with this. And we decided we would lower the car, use a rope to lower the car down here and use a rope to pull the car up here after, of course, unloading it. 
So we took everything off basically that would come off, all of our gear and, and the engine. <laughs> this is the cabin we stayed in while we were at Camp Reynolds. Uh, I don't think I have pictures. So what happened is, as we lowered the car down, because the track was on a curve, it was also canted toward the inside of the curve. So that when the car got most of the way down, the rear end just slid off the track. And so <laughs> I crawled down the track, was hanging in the air, used a railroad tie to pry the car back onto the rails so that we could pull it back up the other side. Unfortunately, neither I nor the car nor the rails nor the ties fell down into the canyon. And this is Niagara Creek and a cookhouse at Camp Niagara and shower car. And inside the mud here were big cat tracks I bet it was a bobcat, but it looked like a mountain lion back then. One of the cabins at Camp Niagara. Last cabin before the bridge. <laughs> Often thought this would be a nice thing to model. Good cabin not to be in during a windstorm. And at Camp Niagara, there were a number of uh, steam donkeys abandoned. I have the brass safety valves from two of them here in my library. It's going to become important later, but of course they have hundreds and hundreds of feet of cable on them. Heavy cable, like you use to pull the logs with, and the light cable, like they use, pull out in the woods to pull the heavy stuff with. I wanted that duplex pump by the time I got back, it was gone. So, coming back to Camp Reynolds, we decided we didn't want to cross the washout the same way. So, we unwound about 600 feet of cable from one of those steam donkeys. And at one end, we fastened it around the rail and nailed it down to the tie. We stretched it, ooh, that's weird. We stretched it clear across, well, there we go. Stretched it clear across the canyon. We found this three cornered block amidst all the junk. So we used a rope to lower the car down. We used a rope to pull the car up and suspended the car from this block, so we build ourselves our own aerial tramway. The wheels, the engine, and all of our junk came back across the same way. Now this was part of the adventure. We went around with a rifle shooting anything that would move. And when a rat ran into this shed, my friend Ted pulled the trigger and the gun misfired. And the rat had run behind this box uh, Mark dynamite. So we thought, wow, well, you know, we've got dynamite, you got to do something with it. So here are empty casings. We took the stuff out. Our limited understanding of the dynamite was either it we have been wet, it would be inert, or it could be sensitive. Fortunately for us, or unfortunately, we were not able to detonate it by any means. We put it against a rock, shot at it with a 30 aught 6 to see if concussion would set it off. But I do have an empty casing in my library. Giant extra dynamite. My friend Dick Jerry Widge rigged this winch to pull a car finally uphill. Here we are skinny dipping in Niagara Creek. And here is the car reassembled on its way back to Tuolumne. When we got into Tuolumne, 
It wasn't time for my dad to be there yet to pick us up. So we hiked down the Sierra Railroad and fortunately that day they were running a steam excursion. So we got to see that. Of course, they had a speeder following the train as fire patrol. And this uh, is the next part of the big adventure. While Ted and Dick went up to the, there's a flume that runs over the track that carried water for the town. While Ted and Dick went up to fill the canteens, I was down here holding the car with the brake and taking an eight millimeter movie. Well, the brake began to slip. And so I thought, that's no problem. I'll just engage the engine. Well, as fate would have it, the ignition switch was on. So the engine just fired up. I thought, well, that's no problem. I'll just uh, turn off the ignition switch. And just about that time, I noticed that since we'd gone up the track, a farmer had placed a piece of wood across the track at the cattle guard that I realized that piece of two by 12 was gonna hit me about chest level. So I reached down quickly and flipped off the ignition switch and bailed out of the car running, fell down on my knees, cut myself on the cattle guard and fully expected that that two by 12 would clear this these two by twos off. Now we coming into town at our age, we had laid the guns down, wrapped them in a tarp right here. So they wouldn't be real obvious. I figured that two by 12 would just clear that stuff off like matchwood. Instead, I was shocked to see that when the car hit the two by 12, it just shattered into fragments that went every which way. And the car went right through the two by 12. And it was at that time that I realized that instead of turning off the ignition, I had actually flipped the close by identical switch, which turned on the headlights. Also, the throttle was arranged so that forward was on, backwards was off. So the shock of hitting that two by 12 had thrown the throttle into full. So now the car took off down the tracks with no one in it at full throttle. And I was running after it as fast as I could on railroad ties in hiking boots and injured. And I probably got within about a foot of it, but that was as close as I ever got. It took off down the tracks in a trail of blue smoke and went around the curve out of sight, which was one of the most dismal times of my life. And as I walked along the tracks, here was a camera bag here run over by the pulley. Here was backpack here. Thinking, of course, that this car is going to go right down into Tuolumne and crash through the mill gate. And since we were doing this without permission, I didn't thought they would probably take a dim view of that happening. But as I got toward the other end of the siding, I heard the car and there are two odd things about it. It seemed to be running at high speed, but it didn't seem to be getting any further away. And what had actually happened is at the other end of the farmer's field, he had put another two by 12, but this time when the car hit it, it flipped under the wheels and derailed the car, which crashed across the highway. Fortunately, no cars were there at the time and into these bushes. And what had happened is the shock of running over that two by 12 had forced the engine up. And when the rod came back down, it missed the little metal cup and went right through the floor, which disengaged the engine. So the engine was still running at high speed, not under load, and not going anywhere. So it meant a trip to the emergency room for a uh, tetanus shot and some stitches, And but there's more to the story. Later that fall, we decided we would like to take the car back to Tuolumne again. So my dad and I got the car uncovered and put fuel in the tank to get ready to start the engine up. And lo and behold, fuel was running out of the tank through a hole about the middle of the tank. And uh, 
the hole had a peculiar shape. It was perfectly round and had a little notch out at the top of it. It took a while to realize what had actually happened is that two, the two by 12 had hit the butt of the 30-06 rifle and had driven it right through the fuel tank, which shows how strong a 1903 A3 Springfield is. And shows how fortunately we were that it didn't make a spark that set the fuel tank on fire, because then the car would have been going down the track at track at full speed with nobody on it on fire, which would have been worse. So that concluded that adventure. These are some of the artifacts in my collection. The original name of this place was Flemon. That sign was under the second sign, which said Fleming. And actually, looking behind me, you're looking at this, my West Side artifacts. That is the dinner chime from Camp 8. Now, if you ever listen to Stan Kistler's Whistles in the Woods, he talks about the triangle they use for a dinner chime. Well, it doesn't sound like a triangle in the, triangles have a distinctive sound, as you probably know. Doesn't sound like a triangle. And this was the piece of rail that was hanging outside the cafeteria at Camp 8. And on the railing next to it was this piece of iron, which is fairly beat up from getting it on the rail. So now you've heard the one and only dinner chime from Camp 8. Here's one of the safety valves from Steam Donkey at Camp Clavy. And unfortunately, somebody had to put a bullet through it. Here's a kerosene lamp from Camp 24, an inspector's lantern from Camp 8, the sign from Dry Tank. And at Camp 24 was this basically a post office box. Here's mail headed for Camp 45 and mail headed for Tuolumne. This is some China from Camp 8. And here is the hand crank telephone from Buffalo Landing. And here is the little telephone directory, dispatcher one bell, Camp 8 four bells. And here's the railroad crossing sign from that abandoned Forest Service road. Here's a bill for a Stockton Record newspaper delivered to the camp. And a wage slip. And a Tuolumne Public Food Market calendar. And of course, we have all these slides and movies on a DVD. I hope you're seeing what I'm seeing. Here is riding on our motorized car. Here is pulling the motorized car across the mud. And here is dry tank. Big rock cut. And that's the valley uh, below River Bridge. Here is the fire watchman shanty and River Bridge. Ted tried to throw this switch, but it wouldn't throw. 
And here we are at our first major crossing of a bridge on a motorized car. This is riding across the bridge taken from the, the uh, where the fire barrel was located. North Fork of the Tuolumne River. Here is riding across the bridge from on the car. And here is a loop. The car had no suspension, so any gravel or rocks on the track made a bumpy ride. And the tank at straight track siding. And here we are traveling through Camp 8 in style. This time we're not trying to push a car with rubber wheels. So it was about 70 miles from Tuolumne to the end of the line at Camp 45. We also went out of the branch line at Fleming, which was probably another 15 miles out and 15 miles back. We were out there for two weeks. And this is the uh, Forestry Service road crossing, the abandoned one. And there is the telephone shack at Camp 21. and some trespassers on the right of way. And those just cows just wouldn't get off the track. We thought if we went a little faster, well, then they'd get off the track. They got some good exercise that day.
water tank at Camp 23. And the water falls behind it. And the line shack for Camp 23. And there across the whole creek gorge is Camp 24 on the other side of the valley. Now this uh, was our first major washout. And so we stopped, got off the car, cranked the throttle down a little, sent the car across by itself to see what would happen, which is actually nothing happened. So we found out that was okay. It's hard to judge what the weight would do. This was the next incident. And that is, the car would sometimes derail if we ran over a, a small rock. This time the car derailed. It, it derailed uphill, which is actually very fortunate. Ted and Dick were thrown off the front onto the bank. They weren't hurt. But you, you'll see what happens if it had derailed downhill. This is the uphill side. Where it de This is the downhill side. It, the car would have gone over the edge. taller than Ted, who's six foot. That's a bony flats and waterfall. So do you notice the jumpiness of the picture? That's because at Camp 24, to make a long story short, we decided it would be fun to take the car around the balloon track because we could. So we threw the switch for the balloon track. We went up the back side of the balloon track and started coming down the back side of the balloon track. But we didn't realize that because only Shays would negotiate that section of track, it had a very steep gradient. So that on the downhill side, the engine brake was not sufficient to hold the car back. So I pulled on the angle iron brake the end of the angle iron glowed red hot and pieces of it were coming off, but it was not sufficient to stop the car either. So at the other end, Dick jumped off, ran ahead and threw the switch so we could get through it. But in the process of doing that, we bent the axle. So over the next course of the next few days, we keep turning the axle and dropping the car till we more or less bent it back into shape. There's Buffalo Landing at Camp Clavy. And the rigging and the diesel engine and Clavy River Bridge. And the gorge of the Clavy River. and headed towards Borland. And here is the Borland River Bridge. And Fireman's Watch Shanty. It was the last of the bridges to remain standing, but it's pretty much fallen down now as well. And here we are crossing the Niagara River Bridge.
here we are coming up on Camp Reynolds, not realizing what waited around the curve. There I am retrieving the line that we to, to pull the car up. Here's the car derailed part right down the near side. And there it is up on the other side, ready to be reassembled. Ted, more or less splitting wood. Uh, wash out over Bear Creek, we just rode over that one. And the line up toward Camp 45. And here was this giant rock right across the tracks. And we wouldn't want to take everything off the car and take it off the rails and roll it around to the left side of the rocks and put it back on the rails and put everything back in it. So we decided to move the rocks. I don't know how much a rock weighed. You can look at it and guess. So we used a railroad tie. We used the three ton jack that we had on the car, which broke. Finally, we were able to move it out of the way, all but about one inch, just one crummy inch. So what we did is we got down behind the car and used the 30 6 rifle to shoot off that last one inch of rock. coming back across Niagara River Bridge. And here's crossing uh, Reynolds Creek on the High Line. And here's Dick operating our makeshift winch. Pulling it back up was a project. It was pretty heavy. And here's the car on the other side of the washout, ready to be assembled, reassembled, going back through Big Rock Cut. And the last fateful picture going under the flume before the great runaway accident. And that is the end. Were you able to see that? Yes, that was great. Uh, anybody have any questions or comments for Nick? Well, that, that was an amazing adventure in 61 to 63. You must remember that forever. Yeah, you know, you've got a lot of record of it. Yeah, it's amazing. And that's something you can never do again. It was a to, to go back and do it three years in a row. Yes. <laughs> I still wish part, part of me still wants to model a West Side Lumber Company. Nick, how much gasoline did you take with you? You know that I was going to say that we took two five gallon tins at Camp Clavy. We had used so little gas, we stashed one of the five gallon tins in the woods and brought it back, picked it up when we came back. We probably used about three gallons. Holy cow. Wow. And how old were you when it did this? Well, let's see, that was 63 and I was born in 45, so 18 something. I hadn't had my birthday yet, so maybe 17. And the fun part is we were on our own. Yes. We got yeah. into trouble. The only way out was we had to figure a way out. 
Can you see parents letting their kids do that today? Oh man, I'll tell you. Video games don't have any comparison, I'll tell you that. No, oh no. Do you have any idea what it would look like now? I can tell you for the most part. Number one, all the track was pulled out, except the track from Tuolumne to River Bridge, which operated as a tourist railroad for a while, and it's still there to this day. So the tr track is very grown up, right away hard to find, but it's worse than that. The Ridge Fire went through that part of the world two or three years ago and just wiped out everything. Whatever was left is gone. On the other hand, a lot of abandoned iron equipment showed up that nobody knew where it was because it was deep in the woods. It's now out in the open. But most of what you saw there, especially after Camp 8, is gone. Nick, I love your stories. That's the best one. It makes me laugh every time. And I always wonder how you survived. Yeah. How you lived to tell the story. Yeah, yeah. It was it was challenging at times. There were risks, but it was sure well worth it. <laughs> it's an off, it's an awesome story. Thank you so much for sharing. Thank you for your kind words. I think you coined the phrase it's better to ask for forgiveness than permission. This is true, yes. Well, we tried to run the car again in fall, a time we had the fuel tank. And when we got back there, the sheriff, you know, came and said, Hey, you can't do this. <laughs> <laughs> That time we didn't get to go. This is John Mick. It was a great trip. Were there three of you on that trip? Three, yes. Right. Myself, my friend Ted, and Dick. Uh, Ted was a classmate, and Dick was a friend from another school district. How much of that did you actually get to model then? And how much of that do you have now? Or I, I can't remember. Well, I, mean, later. What I modeled then. It never got packed to bench work stage because I forgot how slow model railroads grow and how quickly college came. And during my early medical school days, I modeled the yard portion of the west side in our home. But then I got back into uh, standard gauge. And so I'm still there. A part of my heart is always still back in Tuolumne. We've been back many times. You can go there now and uh, not far out of Tuolumne, pick up the railroad uh, at that, where that flume was located and walk track pretty much uh, down toward River Bridge, and at sections of it, you think, wow, it's just like it was, you know. Some of it's washed out, sometimes there's only one rail, but there's still track and there's still a right of way. Of course, the Indians, the Indians own the land where the mill was. There's talk of building a casino, but nothing's happened and everything is rotted into the ground. Well, if there aren't any more uh, comments, I'm going to officially close the, the meeting. This ends the uh, April edition of the Mount Vernon Clinic and um, hope to see you all next month.